Thank you very much. Thanks. So, um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about Japanese, but uh, we are going to see some uh, common um, things, co things common to Chinese, uh, because I'm going to focus on the use of Chinese characters known as kanji in Japanese. Firstly, um, the starting point of this study is a practice that is widely um, observed in the linguistic study of writing systems. In this practice, a given writing system is um, described or referred to as being phonemic or moraic or morphemic, so on. Um, the underlying assumption of this practice is that uh, uh, individual writing systems can be and perhaps should be um, described in terms of a single um, type of linguistic entity such as the phoneme or mora or uh, morpheme. The Japanese writing system has a special place in this practice because it is often described as being a mixed system. Why mixed? Because um, it employs a mixture of um, um, sets of graphs that, are, that differ from each other in terms of both form and function. Um, in, present, in the present Japanese writing system, there are three main sets of graphs. The first two are called hiragana and katakana, and these graphs are basically um, um, described as being more like they represent um, units of sounds called uh, morai or sometimes core syllables. The third set of graphs is called kanji, and this one is the problematic guy because um, there has never been a real consensus on what these graphs really represent, represent or uh, to put it uh, in another way, um, there are different ideas about what they represent. Um, there are, in the literature, two major theories on this topic. The first one is what I referred to as the morphographic theory in which um, individual gra graphs are uh, considered as representing morphemes or uh, building blocks of um, words. The second theory is um, morphophonic theory, which claims that individual, uh, sorry, individual graphs represent sounds that may or may not correspond to morphemes. I would argue that both theories have pros and cons, and I would like to uh, make a new proposal to integrate the advantages of both theories. This is the outline. Um, yeah, I'll go one by one. Um, in the first section, we will look into the notion of kanji as written signs. Um, the diagram here uh, depicts what I consider is a fairly standard view of writing system. Um, a writing system consists of a signary and an orthography, and the signary contains a, a certain number of signs. Each sign consists of two elements. The first one is the graphical form, which I refer to the graph, and uh, the second one is its value, which can be um, sound or meaning, or the combination of sound and meaning. Um, um, it is quite usual for a single writing system to employ different types of signs at the same time. Let me illustrate with um, examples from English. In English, um, uh, we have the letters of the alphabet, which most of uh, which represent individual phonemes, such as the consonant B. At the same time, the writing system also employs other types of signs, for example, semantic signs or morphemic signs and other things. However, um, there seems to be a general agreement that the phonemic signs constitute the core part of the signary, whereas the um, semantic and other things 
uh, placed in the peripheral place within the, gra uh, within the signary. That's why uh, the English writing system is often, maybe not, you, not always, but often uh, described as a primarily phonemic writing system. So we can talk about the um, core and peripheral in the uh, structure of uh, signary, and we can describe our writing system as being primarily based on one specific um, unit of language. With this in mind, let's look at the Japanese writing system. Again, because this is a writing system, it consists of a signary and uh, orthography. However, one striking feature of this writing system is that it has not only one single signary, but um, separate signaries. As I mentioned earlier, in today's Japanese, there are three main um, sets of graphs. From now on, I will refer to them as signaries. Kanji, hiragana, and katakana. All these, sorry, uh, the signs of all these signaries are combined to write the um, utterances in, uh, in, in Japanese. And the example sentence here uh, is just one um, um, way to illustrate the situation. Um, the first four characters are katakana, the next one is hiragana, and these are followed by, uh, sorry, again, uh, katakana and hiragana, and then the complex ones are the kanji and so on. So we mixed things. And uh, this table shows key attributes of kanji, hiragana, and katakana. I'm not going into details. Um, I'm not going to um, 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 talk about every detail of this table, but if you look at the rightmost column of this um, table, um, you will see that these signaries are used f to write different types of words or morphemes. So we can speak of a, a functional division between these signaries within a single writing system. Now, let's uh, shift our focus to kanji, which is the um, uh, main subject of this presentation. Um, again, kanji uh, graphs function as signs, which means it, uh, they have their own values. And in the literature, these values are considered to have two elements. The first one is tr uh, conventionally known as reading or the phonetic interpretation of the graph in question. And the other element is the meaning, which is the semantic interpretation of the reading. Um, however, uh, we will look at this uh, in detail later, but um, in some kanji graphs, the meaning is quite obscure or even non-existent. So that's why um, it is connected to the value node using a dotted line. Um, before we proceed, I need to say something about the reading again. Because the, uh, the graphs and their well, values were uh, historically imported from J uh, Chinese and um, adapted into the Japanese language, uh, most graphs have two types of readings. The first one is referred to as Sino-Japanese, or SJ, and the other one is the Native Japanese, NJ. Now let me give you some examples. On the left-hand side, uh, we have this particular graph, which is read as TO, and uh, it means sugar. Um, this graph is used, can be used by itself to write the word to sugar as a substance, or in combination with other graphs such as tobun sugar content, sato sugar as a condiment, etc., etc. Um, so this graph has only one value. Now this is in contrast with the second example on the right-hand side, which shows the graph for 
en, which means salt, or shio, which means the salt again. En is the Sino Japanese、uh, reading, whereas shio is the native Japanese one. So, as you can see, in many cases,、um, the Sino Japanese and native Japanese readings have、um, same or related meanings. Because、uh, the NJ, sorry, the、uh, native Japanese is, the, is basically the translation of the Chinese vocabulary item. And here again, the graph can be used by itself to represent certain words or in combination with other graphs to represent other words. So、um, I used this diagram to. Uh, visually represent、uh, what I mean by graph value reading and meaning, but from now on I will just、um, put things in a linear fashion and、um, use the column to,、um, to indicate the association between a graph and its value. And if there are more than two values, I will just、um, separate them using the vertical line. So, to sum up so far, Um, kanji graphs con constitute a signary in the Japanese writing system. And each kanji graph has one or more values. Each value consists of a reading and optionally a meaning. And finally, kanji graphs are used either individually or in combinations to write actual words. Importantly, from a linguistic viewpoint, The terms reading and meaning that I have been using don't tell much about the values associated with individual kanji graphs.、Um, it is necessary to describe those values in terms of particular linguistic entities so that we can clearly see what type of written signs kanji graphs constitute. And this is Uh, the topic, the main topic. And、uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are two theories on this topic. The first one is morphographic, and the second one is morphophonic. Firstly,、um, the morphographic theory has been um, 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 described in the most、uh, In a very、uh, systematic way by Joyce in a series of his studies. There have been、um, other studies expressing similar views, but in this presentation I'm going to focus on Joyce's version of this theory. The other one, morphophonic theory, was、um, presented by Matsunaga in her studies, and、um, this theory is. Based on a study of Chinese、um, presented by De Francis. Now, these two theories have、uh, many differences, but、um, the most striking differences are related to what c o n s t i t u t e the basic sign in kanji and what the values are. And they use different types of evidence. So let me um, um, describe these differences、uh, briefly in the next few minutes. But before that, we need to、um, check what we mean by the morpheme, because this, is, this will be the key to the discussion. The textbook definition of the morpheme is that it is the smallest unit of language that carries information about meaning or function. For example, the word graphemics can be、um, analyzed into four、um, morphemes. For example, the first morpheme is graph, and we cannot divide this、um, element into smaller, meaningful units. So, this is considered as a morpheme. The next three go、uh, for the same reason. And、uh, they are concatenated to make up the word in question. 
this is this kind of analysis is called morphology, and it is distinct from phonology, which is the analysis of the sound form of the word in question. With this in mind, the first theory, morphographic theory, the the key idea of this theory is that individual graphs correspond to morphemes in the Japanese writing system. And um, this is true in eight out of nine types of two kanji words that constitute the largest subset of um, Japanese words that are represented in kanji. This is according to Joyce. Um, the table shows some of the examples taken from Joyce's argument. And uh, yes, there are, okay, um, each word represents a specific type of word structure. And um, Joyce distinguishes nine types of such words, and he maintains that a graph corresponds to a morpheme in a one-to-one -one correspondence in eight out of these nine types. The last one on the, I mean, the, the one on the, 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 at the bottom of the table is the only exception where the graphs represent syllables rather than the morphemes of the word in question. Why can we say that? Because the word in question, budo, which means grape, um, is, oh sorry, consists of one single morpheme. There is no evidence suggesting that it contains two or more separate morphemes. So we have two graphs representing one morpheme, and these graphs are indicating the syllable, the phonetic, ph phonological property of the word in question. I do agree with um, Joyce's um, idea that uh, there is a general tendency for individual graphs to represent morphemes in Japanese. However, there is a serious problem. Synchronically, morphological analysis is dubious in semantically opaque words. What do I mean by semantically opaque words? Let's um, describe this uh, using uh, sorry, uh, examples. There are four words um, grouped together, and on the top we have kokudo, which means national road. The first graph represents koku, which in many words mean country or nation, and the second one uh, corresponds to do, which is road or way or street. Okay? So the combination of country and road immediately gives you the idea that this is a national road. There is a, or in other words, the word of the, sorry, the meaning of the word can be um, predicted from the sum of the constituent meanings. In contrast, in the second example, Benkyo study, we have two graphs representing strive and strong. The combination of strive and strong is study, is this straightforward? Maybe, maybe not, depends on the interpretation. But um, it is not as clear cut as the uh, national road, perhaps. How about the third one, conchu insect? The first graph is a problematic one because it does represent, oh sorry, correspond to con, but there is no um, synchronic reason to assume that this con means anything in today's Japanese. Historically, it used to denote multitude. So the multitude of bugs indicates insect. Yes, this is the historical fact. However, the meaning has gone obsolete. Very few Japanese people actually know this meaning associated with this particular character and graph. So we can't really analyze the word in question into two meaningful parts because the beginning part is meaningless in today's Japanese. Um, the last word, I such greet. Yes, we have two such graphs with obsolete meanings. I used to mean push and the other, uh, such men, uh, used to mean press, push and press, greet. Hmm. Even if you knew the 
meaning, original meaning, it's very difficult to um, get the meaning of the word itself. You have to look into the tradition of Zen Buddhism. If you are interested in that, I will talk about that later. But um, let me um, um, proceed to the second theory, morphonic theory. Basically, Matsunaga is saying that many graphs contain a phonetic element and all graphs trigger sounds in processing. Um, to see this more exactly, um, there, are, there are some examples on the left-hand side. The element highlighted in blue can be a, an independent graph by itself or an element within a, a number of other graphs. And when it is um, contained in a complex graph, it indicates the Sino-Japanese reading, G. Okay? So, in this sense, if there is this element, there is this pronunciation. However, this is not always the case, as the last graph indicates. The last one is read as Tai rather than G. So the phonetic element doesn't work in this particular graph. Matsunaga's argument is that um, nearly 90% of kanji graphs contain um, historical phonetic elements, and even in today's Japanese, over 60% of these phonetic elements do indicate certain pronunciations. So we can't really ignore the role of phonetic, uh, sorry, phonetic information in kanji. And even if the phonetic element doesn't work, according to Matsunaga, we humans process kanji readings by first accessing the phonological information carried by the, um, the graph and then um, access the semantic information of the word being written. There are problems. Um, synchronically, phonetic elements have limited phoneticity or efficiency in terms of representing sounds. Besides, it is open to question whether the architecture of a writing system can be explained entirely in terms of the way the human reader processes its signs. There is this study uh, by, conducted by Stauff, um, which argues that the phoneticity of these phonetic elements is quite limited in today's Japanese. Okay. And the question about the psychology is an open one. Uh, I guess there has been a lot of discussion about this, but um, yes, I believe that it still remains an open question. So to sum up, both um, theories um, have its have their pros and cons. Yes, many kanji graphs do correspond to morphemes. Yes, many graphs do represent sounds. However, um, both theories um, suffer from the problem of what constitutes exceptions and what constitutes the main thing. So, uh, two minutes. Two minutes, Can thank you. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry for this. Um, yeah, very quickly, a new proposal. Okay, um, basic premises here. All kanji written words can be read out and are hence related to sound. However, um, this is true regardless of whether the kanji graphs being used have functioning phonetic elements. So we depart from Matsunaga's argument here. Okay. In some cases, yes, phonetic elements may work. In others, it may not work. Okay? However, regardless of this, all kanji written words can be read out. Now, the third point. Many kanji graphs do relate to morphemes, but morphological analysis is often hindered by semantic opacity and other factors. Again, yes, phonology, uh, sorry, morphology may have an important um, role, but the, that's not the entire thing. So my proposal is um, rather than, uh, sorry, firstly, rather than looking at phonetic elements, let's look at the graphs and what are their values, phonological exponents of morphemes. 
Okay? Morpheme is the unit of meaning. It doesn't have any sound. However, in language, it is um, moved on to the domain of phonology for uh, being pronounced. So, um, I assume that each graph corresponds to the phonological form, if that's a better term, of the morpheme in question. Uh, sorry, just very quickly, uh, let's look at some of the, these, uh, just one or two of these examples. Okay. Jidai means era. Okay. Uh, the first character corresponds to ji, and the next one to dai. Okay. And um, in my, excuse me, in my model, the first one corresponds to the pronunciation. The second one um, corresponds to the pronunciation. And each of these pronunciations corresponds to a particular morpheme in one uh, type of morph uh, morphological analysis. However, if you are not happy with this analysis, you can say that G and Dai constitute only one single morpheme. If you assume that the graph um, corresponds to the sound or the um, phonological property, this is not a problem. Okay? They just represent the sound of the morpheme or morpheme Z. Right? So, um, so um, basically, this is the idea. Okay? Um, as you can see, um, my proposal is not a radical new departure from the existing, existing theories or anything like that. This is an attempt at um, integrating the advantages of existing theories. Why do I do that? Because um, I would like to have a descriptive and theoretically neutral account of how kanji graphs function in today's Japanese. Okay. Um, I would like to have a synchro strictly synchronic approach for this, even though history does have a uh, huge impact on today's written form in the language. There are many remaining issues, and I would appreciate if you could give me in, um, input. These are references, and thank you for your attention. Some time for questions? Yes, please. Could you go back to the slide where you talk about Stolf? Mm, sorry, um, Stolf, Stolf, Stolf. Yeah. There were, there's this intriguing table on the right where you talk about PCs, and I. Yes. That's. I don't know what those are. What is a PC? Oh, I'm. Yes, of course. Uh, okay, I uh, mentioned phonetic element. This is often referred to as phonetic component, and I got mixed up. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. This should have been PE or phonetic element. And so, is the the point of the analysis is to show that because it's not a a constant phonetic contribution, or, that therefore the phonetics cannot be what are what are represented mentally. Is that roughly correct? Um, um, I, I think there is no denying that uh, phonetics or phonological information have a great role in our press, uh, reading process. However, um, this is a separate issue from what graphs represent in the written form or uh, the let me put it this way. Um, this is a separate issue from the basic principle on which the signary is organized. Or maybe not. So there needs to be a real um, discussion of the place of psychology in the study of signaries and writing systems. That's what I think. OK, thank you. Thanks. Two more questions. First, Yanis. Uh, yes, my question is more about um, morphophonic and morphographic because they are more extreme and your, your approach is a bit in the middle. And 
so Sure already said that um, oral language is learned spontaneously, but written language is taught. So somebody is teaching these characters to young Japanese. Yeah. So is education uh, oriented to the morphophonic theory or to morphographic? So how does a teacher present a new character to pupils? Is it in the phonic way or in the graphic way? That's a very interesting question. Um, uh, from my experience, I can tell that um, if you go to a Japanese school, you learn lots of kanji, and you learn the form and its meaning. Uh, sorry, its uh, reading, the pronunciation. Okay. However, uh, this this combination of graph and uh, pronunciation is all, always given within the word. Okay. So, for example, jidai, um, the word for era. Um, uh, when you are learning the first character, uh, you will learn to write it, learn to read it, and uh, at the same time, you are given the words in which that character function. So uh, this type of education, I guess, is toward inclined to morphophonic theory rather than morphographic theory. Probably. And uh, morpheme is a very theoretical construct, uh, particularly proposed in linguistics, and we don't do linguistics at primary school. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> it's a pity. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, uh, pronunciation is taught, and it must have a massive impact on how we see kanji graphs. That's my guess. Um, cover all the entire uh, of, uh, uh, in no no, no. <laughs> um, how do you deal uh, with um, cases of uh, that are synonymous different words different phonetic realizations such as mm -hmm. Thank you. That's another interesting question. Um, at the moment, I'm thinking that, um, okay, in Japanese, there are many kanji which have the same reading okay, with different meanings. And uh, in my approach, um, I would have to say that uh, any graph can be used to represent a particular sound pronunciation in any word. However, this inventory of loads of graphs is filtered by orthography, and this orthography is uh, based on the meaning of the word. So, for example, there are many kanji for the syllable ji. However, the meaning of the word, for example, jidai, requires that you choose this particular graph to be used, not other ones. Stop here. The next presenter is already waiting. Thank you. Sorry for that. Thanks so much.